Maybe I screwed it up already. All right, good morning. My name is Mark Brown. I'll be an instructor for this class, and uh, we're going to get started then. So this lecture, we're going to be talking about the state pattern. Um, so kind of a rough overview of what it is we're actually going to be talking about today. We're going to do some design patterns. This is actually a very large topic, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. It's just going to be kind of a general overview of it, uh, kind of an idea of what it is. Uh, we're going to be going over the state pattern in specific. We're going to be a bit deeper dive on that, since that is going to be the pretty big focus on the actual class. And then a little bit of application of it. How does this stuff actually work in the real industry? <laughs> so design patterns. What are design patterns? Well, when Ford decides they're going to design a new Mustang, they don't immediately start figuring out how that newfangled wheel works. They have an established set of rules where they understand how things are actually supposed to work. Design patterns are something very similar to that for the actual development process, software development. So in the early days of software development, they started noticing that they kept running into the same problems over and over and over again. And there's many different solutions for those. Um, and sometimes the solutions were pretty good, sometimes they weren't so good. So a group of programmers got together, they called themselves the Gang of Four, and they actually wrote up a book, and it's kind of a recipe book, saying, okay, these are the best ways to approach these problems and fix these problems in general. Now, it's not going to say these are always going to be the best in every situation, but it's kind of a generalized situation where you may have, you know, uh, you want to be using this for different types of stuff, you want to be able to use it for various types of things. These are generally the best as a just kind of overview state. So again, not to say that these are always going to be the very best possible, but they're always going to be the kind of the best in general. And one of these design patterns they came up with was this idea of the state pattern. So what is a state pattern? The, the state pattern is, a, is also known as the finite state machine, which is kind of my preferred free, uh, reference of it, because the name right there also explains exactly what it does. It's a finite number of states. It's a finite state that's going to be in. So what you have is you have situations where you have something in a specific state, and then something happens to it. Some, some, in, in, uh, some, some input occurs, and that input causes the state to change. So you have a happy state, and then someone says something mean to you, so you turn into a sad state. And then you want to laugh at that guy, so you move to a laughing state, etc. This is all usually tracked by a variable. Typically, it's named something along the lines of current state or, or next uh, current state uh, to let you know exactly what state it is. And there's some sort of transition that occurs. Um, again, that transition can occur for various reasons, but you know, in this case, we're just saying, okay, that that variable has changed. It's going to adjust the transition. So when the game is actually running, you actually have an object that changes its pattern. So you have something like a guard or a uh, uh, switch or something along those lines that, based on what is happening to it, is actually changing its behavior. The classical example of this is the stoplight. So a stoplight is a, a, a perfect example of what a finite state machine does. It starts off in the green state. It waits a few seconds and it turns over to the, green, yeah, the yellow state. Waits a few seconds there, turns over to the red state. Each of these states is only up for a short amount of time, a finite amount of time, and immediately transitions over. You're never actually going to be in two states at once, or else someone's going to take a picture of it and put it on the Internet with a funny caption. <clears throat> it's always going to only be one state at a time if it's correct. So what caused an object to change from one state to another? What's transition states? What caused these to transition? Transitions are pretty much anything you can think of. In the example of the, the traffic light, it was actually based on time. So time will allow to change from one to the other. Um, you could also do input. So if the, the, trans, the, uh, oops, the traffic light, something happens to the traffic light, someone walks up to the post, pushes a button on the, on the post, opens up that, that box you always see as you walk up to it, and it's actually able to change stuff inside there, and so it's blinking the yellow light saying, caution, 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 there's a wreck here, something along those lines. It can be some sort of input that makes it change. It can also just be something else, some arbitrary thing, like the timer. So this actually applies to actual games as well. So we have a character that walks around. We want him to jump. We press the jump button. That jump button says, hey, change your state from walking to jump. You go up in the air. The gravity starts pulling it down. It slows down. It's upward. It says, okay, I'm no longer jumping. Now I'm falling based on that gravity. So that gravity starts pulling it down, now you're in a falling state. Well, once you hit the ground, you're back on the land state, so you may do a sweet landing animation. Once you do that landing animation, then you're back to standing in an idle state until someone pushes forward, you start walking again. So there's always just all these different transitions that occur and make your state change. Now, one of the things we do with this class specifically, and you see it a lot in the industry as well, is we use something called a data model. So what is the data model? 
Well, we have the states, and the states are kind of the doers. They're with this, the part of the model that's actually thinking about doing stuff, sort of part of the, uh, the state machine that actually thinks about doing stuff. And then you have the data model, which is kind of the state that knows about stuff. So we're talking about walking. Well, how fast are we going to walk? Well, let's check that data model and see how fast it wants us to walk. Okay, we're going to jump. Well, how high are we going to jump? Well, let's check that data model and check what that, how much, how high we're actually going to jump. Now, why do we do this? What, what, what is the data model good for? Why do we even want to do this? Well, by having that data model, you're actually setting up a place where anytime you want to access this memory, anytime you want to access that data, you have to go through this guardian. You have to go through this data model and say, it will actually act as a guardian of that data. So if you need to check and say, okay, we're getting some weird bug going on with the data, you have a location to check and see where that, that bug is occurring. So you can look into that and say, okay, I'm looking in here and I'm saying, oh, whoops, I forgot that. I divided by that number instead of multiplied it. You check there for bugs because that's where all your data is being held and cared for. One of the principal components of the idea of object-oriented programming is that objects take care of themselves. So you have this data model objects and they're taking care of that data. So, you know, one of the things they refer to, you call this is code bottlenecking. So anytime it needs to get access, that information has to go through this location. You know exactly where it is. Also, if someone comes down and says, you know what, we're no longer going to do just whole numbers. We don't, we don't want to int there. We want to float. We want to be able to actually do fractions to do specific versions of that number. It doesn't have to actually be just one. It could be 1.25. So instead of having to go through your code and search down every instance of that variable, you go to the data model and you say, no, it's no longer a float, an int. It's a float. And you're able to change it there. Change it once instead of 30 places. So you're actually able to go through and adjust your model. Now, this may seem silly, like, oh, I'm not going to change this. I'll know this ahead of time. But you're never guaranteed what's going to happen with this piece of code. You're going to write this code. Five years later, it's still going to be used. And so someone's going to need to actually be able to go in there and read it and change it. And you want to actually have them change it only in one place, and it changes across the board, instead of having somebody else go through and search and find all that stuff. Notice I'm saying somebody else. In this five years, you're not guaranteed to be the keeper of this code the entire time. You maybe you've moved on, maybe you've gone to another company, maybe you've, you've gone up, you no longer work with that stuff. So you always need to make it so that it's easy for other people to do that, or else you get that angry email in the middle of the night saying, you jerk, I'm going to come get you. So how does this actually apply in the real world? Isn't it easier to keep things simple, Mark? Well, yes and no. Like I said earlier, I was talking about the idea of the guardian. If you have this code and you're actually allowing it to be available to other people, uh, to actually look at, which a game, de game to development team of one, there is, they do exist, but they're getting less and less common, seems to be the case. So if you have someone else looking at your, your code, actually using your code, and maybe they don't quite understand it. So maybe this number you're trying to pass into it is actually being divided by. Well, someone doesn't understand that. You're saying, okay, this is a time variable. You've got to adjust this value. The smaller it is, the faster it goes. It's like, okay, cool, I get that. Well, I want it to be instant, so I want to set that value to zero. At this point, suddenly you're dividing by zero, and it's going to crash the system. You're going to end up blowing up the universe if you do that. So you can't do that. So you're able to use this code, this little bit of code, and sit there and say, okay, the data coming in, let's check that data out. Hey, he's trying to pass this value of zero. We can't do a zero. We can't divide by zero. Then you can either outright reject it, say, no, we can't take a value of zero, or you can do some adjustments, say, oh, no, it's not actually zero. It's .0001, some so just infinitely small value. And say, okay, that'll work instead. So you can do stuff like that inside that data model to check to keep it simple. To sorry, you can do stuff in that data model to protect yourself, make it so it doesn't actually break things, and make sure your program still keeps working. Also, by following these design patterns, by using this data model, you're actually able to adjust your de your defect injection rate and hopefully make it less. Uh, what is a defect injection rate? You may ask. So there is no programmer in the world that writes perfect code the first time. It just doesn't happen. People always input bugs into code. And there's a whole bunch of study, the whole, whole field of study on this, where people actually take and they write up and they see how much code, yeah, how much lines of code versus how much bugs are being imported. So it's like, okay, if you have someone that's actually writing at a one-to-one -one ratio, they write one line of code and they infer one bug, they may need to be looked into. But they, there's, you know, science and whatnot based on the, uh, the actual development process where they say, okay, per X number of lines of codes, we're going to be inputting in X number of bugs. And they have to actually track that so they know how much time to give people to actually track down these bugs and fix it in the development process. By using these design patterns, by using this data model, by using the stuff that's already been established and already works, you can reduce that number because you're using stuff that has been established, has been is understood, and is used over and over and over again. 
So then once you've got your bugs injected into your code, which you're going to do no matter what, uh, you can actually go through and you can actually debug based on this. It actually helps you out debugging. Instead of getting your code all worked out and getting everything all work, all finished up, then trying to press play and it just doesn't work, it's like, oh, no, it doesn't work. You actually started approaching it systematically and say, okay, what's not working here? Well, the character's not walking right. Well, let's look at the walk state and we can see what's going on there. Okay, the walk state looks really, really good here, but he's pulling in the speed, and the speed seems to be something going on. So let's jump over to this data model and take a look at that speed. Oh, we're dividing by zero, and it lets you figure out what's going on based on that. So it'll help you actually figure out how your bugs are being made and how they're being injected in the code. On top of that, it actually help you figure out how to debug these, this code a bit easier. Make things slightly easier on you. I think that's the best thing that you can do. So as you're working on this stuff, you're going to start asking yourself, well, okay, we're doing these states. So obviously, state states are only good for traffic lights. No, not really. They're pretty much used pretty in anything in the game. And anything you have that's a complex object, you have a character that walks and runs and jumps and shoots, shoots machine guns and fires bullets and yada, 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 those are going to necessitate a whole very complex object, yes. So in here we have examples. We have move, movement, we have jump, we have double jump, we have dash, we have teleport. That's like a Metroid character, something along those lines. You have all these different abilities based on that. But it doesn't necessarily have to be used on just these ultimately complex objects. It doesn't have to be something in a very complex, very messed up thing. You can do it as simple as, simple as a barrel. You can do it as something as simple as a coin. By by using this data model, by using the idea of a state machine, you're able to actually jump around and get changes as transitions. But again, this doesn't have to be a complex object. You can use it in anything. In fact, if you look at your actual game pro progress itself, how a game is actually running, the game itself is running off the state machine. You start up your game, it starts loading up, so it goes into a load state. Once it's already started, once it's loaded up, it says, "Okay, now it's time to show off all those flash, those splash screens." So we have to show the Unreal logo, we have to show the Unity logo, we have to show the actual game logo, etc. These things are required to do, so they go into this state and they handle that. Once that's all done, it loads up the menu. It says, "Okay, now we're in the menu. We're going to go into a waiting state to wait for the player to input some stuff." So the player has to go to a load state to load up the games. You go to the start new games. You go to the options and adjust its resolution, its field of view. These are all different states it goes through. Goes into the actual game state itself. Says, "Okay, we're loading up level one one. Let's show what's going on." They play that for a while or in this game state, and they have many state machines running inside there. Once they exit out of that, they go back to the menu state, and then from the menu state to the exit. This, the, the core component, the core foundation of how a game works is based on a state machine. So, in summary, it's a really quick lecture here. What, what did we talk about here? So we talked about design patterns. Again, remember, this is the idea of a general case situation, the stuff that's going to work Recipes that are, are used throughout the industry, but again, they're not always going to be the most specific. They're not always going to be the guaranteed working great 100% of the time, but they are going to work good most of the time, so it's a general state. We talked about the state pattern, which lets you take, take and have a, a different behavior based on different variables. So usually it's got a time variable, maybe it's an input, vari vari no, input variable, stuff along those lines. You can actually change how your character is behaving based on some sort of input. Remember, you can only have one active state at a time, or else you get a picture put up on the internet and everybody laughs at you. And finally, we have applications of it, how these things are actually being used. So you can use them for objects, characters, AI, menu. The list goes on and on. I'm just reading off the thing here, but you can use it for everything and anything. And that's pretty much it. So thank you. Have a nice day.